How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 61st video on the channel and today we're going to be beginning our 8th book, Character Analysis by Willem Reich. This is an interesting work for a number of reasons, but I feel it's particularly valuable for this channel due to how important Reich is to the Losing Quarters project, especially when it comes to Anti-Oedipus. In terms of how I'm going to structure this series, I've decided to split the book into two sections, the one dealing with parts 1 and 2, the other with part 3. The reason for this lies in just how massively different they are, both in tone and in content. Whilst the first two sections are fundamentally psychoanalytic, the third, stitched on long after character analysis was originally published, is instead focused on what Wright calls organ biophysics. As a final aside and warning, this, along with every other video in the series, will deal with sexual topics. I also want to stress that I try my best to impartially present books on this channel even if there are certain ideas that I strongly disagree with. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. Reich begins chapter 1 of the work, titled Some Problems of Psychoanalytic Technique, by exploring just that. In his eyes, the central issue lies in whether or not it's possible to develop a functional practice based on psychoanalytic theory. As he relates, there are almost as many techniques as there are analysts, although certain tenets developed by the likes of Freud do remain relatively constant. For example, to borrow his words, All neuroses can be traced back to the conflict between repressed instinctual demands, among which the sexual demands of early childhood are never missing, and the ego forces which ward them off. The repression of this conflict is what leads to the neurotic symptom, as it can no longer be resolved. Following this, analysis seems pretty straightforward. Eliminate that repression by bringing what's unconscious to the level of consciousness. Eliminate the symptom. To do this, free association is put into play, and the patient essentially says anything that comes to mind. No matter how seemingly insignificant or unrelated the emerging material might seem at first. However, the whole operation is complicated by what Wright calls countercathexis. This, as shown here, involves the ego or self essentially wrestling with the drive for unconscious desires and thoughts to break through into action and consciousness. Sometimes, the superego even gets involved, the agency responsible for morality and self-punishment, which makes the patient feel guilty about daring to think or desire such things. By setting up resistances as barricades against the emergence of repressed material, countercathexis can often make adhering to free association difficult or even impossible. As such, Reich explains that analytic technique can't really work directly, but rather has to progress through breaking down resistances. This entails first making the patient aware of what they're doing, followed by what means they're using, and only then what's actually hiding. As Reich says, unconscious desires and fears are always trying to get out. In other words, they seek linkages with real people and situations something that manifests itself in the analytic arrangement as something called transference. This consists of relationships between patient and analyst based on emotions like love, hate, and fear that, without the former really being aware of it, usually repeat older childhood experiences. For Reich, the transference is one of the most important subjects of interpretation, since, in his view, all neuroses stem from the very situations that it repeats. However, as he also states, since, in the transference, the patient either tries to supplant the explanatory work of the analysis or refuses to take cognizance of these attitudes, it usually develops into a resistance. To give some more context, transference is often divided into positive forms, based on love, and negative ones, based on hate. The latter is easily identified as a resistance, since animosity obviously makes treatment more difficult. However, the former can also be quite problematic, both in the way that it can leave a patient to try to please the analyst, violating free association, and in how it can flip into the negative, due to things like disappointment. As we'll see later, this idea of positive transference being a potential minefield is one of the defining themes that pervades the entirety of character analysis. However, for now, Wright takes a bit of a step back to address the main divergent techniques developed on this relatively accepted common ground. In particular, he focuses on the role of the analysts themselves. Traditionally, they are relatively passive in psychoanalysis, only offering interpretations at opportune moments, 
in order to avoid curtailing the stranger's thought of their patience. Nevertheless, what exactly this means differs quite a bit from person to person. Reich relates that some go as far as to stay completely silent in the hope that everything works itself out with time. Unsurprisingly, he disagrees with this. However, even in cases where the analyst actually acts to manage transference or to break down resistances, arguments about specifics abound. In Reich's words, When, for instance, a certain resistance situation is described, one analyst thinks that this, another that that, and a third that the other should be done. At the end of the day, the analyst who originally described the situation is just left more confused. Regardless, Reich does believe that there are such things as optimal solutions to specific cases, hence the need to establish a criteria that could possibly clear up all these technical problems. He stresses that this can't be rigid in any sense, since it's the details of the situation that ultimately determine the technique. Instead, his goal is to simply outline a flexible groundwork, one that can act as a broad frame of reference. Ending the section, Reich specifies that he's also only really interested in the beginning and end of analysis. The two problems this book aims to clear up are that of teaching patients how to be analyzed in the first place, and that of resolving the transference, with the bulk of analytic work only being secondary. It's on this note that we arrive at chapter 2, titled The Economic Viewpoint in the Theory of Analytic Therapy. Reich begins by again outlining the necessity of focusing on resistances before direct interpretation, although now adding a glimpse into psychoanalytic history. Initially, he says, so-called resistance analysis held that bringing the repressed source of a symptom to consciousness necessarily led to its disappearance. However, empirical evidence would eventually push Freud to change the phrasing to be much less certain. To borrow Reich's words again, Now, one was confronted by a new and difficult problem. If becoming conscious, by itself, was not enough to effect a cure, what other factors were necessary to cause the symptom to disappear? To find a solution, our author looks towards Freud's many-leveled metapsychology, in particular, at his topographical, dynamic, and economic facets. To give a quick rundown, the first of these looks at the mind through the lens of a layered system made up of the unconscious, preconscious, and conscious. The second, on the other hand, is concerned with the different forces at work, like cathexis and countercathexis. Finally, the third deals with amounts of energy, also called libido, that can flow or get trapped. When it comes to the problem at hand, the topographical viewpoint doesn't really work that well. As we've already seen, it's not enough to just take something from one level and transpose it on another. Likewise, although it doesn't go into detail, Reich doesn't see the dynamic position as particularly helpful. With those two exhausted, we're naturally left with the economic position. However, this poses a problem. It's easy enough to pinpoint features of a former two in analytic practice, but the quantitative dimension is a bit more difficult given the qualitative appearance we're most often met with. For Reich, the answer lies in sexuality, libido being a specifically sexual energy after all. Neurosis is seen by him to be characterized by a disturbed or dysfunctional sex life, particularly when it comes to the ability to orgasm. As in a bit of an aside, this is an element of Reich's work that is more than a little controversial, Freud famously calling it his hobby horse. However, to return to the text, he sees its absence as the somatic core of neurosis, linked to the libidinal economy being dammed up and energy not being able to flow. With this in mind, Reich argues that the entire situation becomes clear. On the topographical level, the content of a repressed idea is revealed. On the dynamic one, there is a kind of alleviation caused by breaking down some of the barricades set up by countercathexis. However, in Reich's words, these processes in themselves do not effect very much of a change at the source of the energy of the symptom or neurotic character trait. The libido stasis remains. One of the goals of analysis is essentially to make resolving sexual tension possible, which in turn leads to a readjustment of the patient's libidinal economy. In order to set the groundwork for this task, it's not enough to just rely on suggestion, direct interpretation, or what have you. Rather, the analyst must undertake a thorough analysis 
of these sexual inhibitions rooted in the patient's character, which can be defined provisionally as the shell of resistances that protect the ego. Here, Reich takes a step back to examine an approach outlined by fellow psychoanalyst Hermann Nunberg. When it comes down to it, they do agree on quite a few things. For example, Nunberg says that the purpose of analysis is to allow the drives to achieve discharge or release. Moreover, he believes that making peace between the id, the source of those drives, and the ego is incredibly important. However, where he and Reich diverge is in the method used to achieve these tasks. Nunberg represents the old view that our author spent most of this chapter arguing against. That's to say, he holds that simply remembering is enough for libido to be released. Additionally, Nunberg's technique avoids attacking resistances directly and instead relies on exploiting positive transference to allow the analyst to gain a foothold in the inside of a patient's ego itself. At this point, Reich offers three opposing arguments. To start off with, this second operation can often be dangerous, since, as we touched on earlier, there's no true positive transference that lasts. In Reich's eyes, the early stages of analysis are characterized by narcissism on the part of the patient. They always carry a certain infantile need for protection. Very quickly, this can turn into hate as it becomes overpowered by things like disappointment, something that is especially the case when the analyst aggressively chases after it. As he himself puts it, It is precisely through such procedures that we bring about the most severe, most devious, and least controllable manifestations of negative transference. Tragically, the outcome of such technique can often take the form of suicide, particularly when the analyst establishes an artificially positive attitude for the patient. Moving on, another problematic aspect of Nunberg's approach lies in how these analysts to accept superficial interpretations that agree with what they're trying to specifically develop. All this does is delude both members of our analytic dyad and hide the true situation. Finally, if anxiety does appear to disappear as treatment goes on, it is very possible that only a portion of libido has been directed towards the transference, whilst those negative feelings are simply covered up. It's on this rather abrupt note that we finish the first two chapters of Character Analysis by Willem Reich, having gained an understanding of the importance of our economic viewpoint resistance analysis, and the dangers of positive transference. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments, so I can do better. Next time, we'll most likely be continuing this book. Until then, bye!